Okay, this is going to be a look at deductive reasoning from section 2.3 in geometry. As you can see here, we've got up a conditional statement. If the lines are playing, then it's a win. We're going to look at the implications of this statement and the kinds of things that we can deduce from knowing certain pieces of information. So section 2.3. We're going to be looking at symbolic notation. We can use this symbolic notation so that the conditional statement mess is less confusing. What that means is instead of writing out all these things longhand, we can start to do shorthand to talk about some of these statements. For example, if we look at P representing the hypothesis, this is a pretty, a pretty common occurrence. So P represents the hypothesis. Now we don't have to necessarily write the whole hypothesis. We can just have P representing it. So then we're going to have Q representing the conclusion. So at the bottom, we have P representing the hypothesis and Q representing the conclusion. So if we were going to look at what this means as a conditional statement from a symbolic notation standpoint, we could say if P, then Q. So if P, then Q. We've already made it shorter. So the symbolic notation is benefiting us at this point. So what does this mean? If we look at this conditional statement, if the sun is out, then the weather is good, this question at the bottom here asks us, how, can we, how do we write the conditional in P's and Q's? On the previous slide, we looked at if P, then Q. But we can simplify it even further. Because if we look to if P then Q, there's an even simpler way to write it. If we simply take the P and Q and we put an arrow in between them, we are saying that these statements are equal. If P then Q is the same thing as saying P arrow Q. So we would read that if P then Q or P arrow Q. That's how symbolic notation can, helps us, can help us. So now we don't have any words in there. We have P arrow Q. Knowing this about conditional statements, we can then go on to say, if we have the converse, we can say certain things. So if we're using P and Q as the hypothesis and the conclusion, our hypothesis conclusion is if P then Q or P arrow Q. So then if we're talking about the converse, we're simply switching Q and P. So if Q then P becomes Q arrow P. That's all we're doing. Whether we're talking about the inverse, converse, or contrapositive, negation, or anything, it's simply the same process as using the words, only we're using P's and Q's to represent the words. So that's the converse. If we're looking at the biconditional now, what the biconditional is, is a conditional statement, its converse, combined into one big package. So what happens is this. If we have this conditional, if P then Q, or P arrow Q, the biconditional then becomes P double-headed arrow Q, because it can be read both ways. This means P if and only if Q. So our biconditional has two conditions. It has a double-headed arrow. All right? So if the conditional is P then Q, the biconditional could be P if and only if Q, or P double-headed arrow Q. So something for you to do. I'm going to give you a few minutes here to write down what you think these are. If P is the value of X is negative 5, and Q is the absolute value of X is 5, you can go ahead and pause the video now if you want to try this exercise on your own. So we're following the directions here and saying, I want you to write this using the words, and write Q then P using the words. So you can go ahead and pause the video now if you want to do this exercise, and then check your answers when we come back. Okay, we're back. So you should have written P arrow Q, or if P then Q in words, and if Q then P in words. See if this is what you got. If the value of X is negative 5, 
then the absolute value of x is 5. The yellow is representing the p, the purple is representing the q. So in part b, if you wrote if q then p in words, you would have if the absolute value of x is 5, then the value of x is negative 5. If we were to do an extension of this exercise and say, let's try to write the biconditional. We would check to see, is the first condition true? If the value of x is negative 5, then the absolute value of x is 5. Well, that's true, so I'm going to go ahead and put a check by that one. If we look at the second statement, however, the converse, because q arrow p is the converse, we would see that if the absolute value of x is 5, x could be equal to 5, or x could be equal to negative 5. So this is not true. So therefore, if we're dissecting the biconditional, we have to say that the biconditional is false. So we cannot write p double arrow q because that's false. The biconditional is not true because the converse is not true. The subject of negation. This comes in handy when we are dealing with the inverse and with the contrapositive. And if I have my statement here that angle 3 measures 90 degrees and that's represented by p, so this is equal to p, then we're going to say that if angle 3 does not measure 90 degrees, that's going to be equal to not p with an emphasis on the not. So that means that the symbol for negation is going to be the tilde. So that's the negation symbol. It works with P or Q or any other letter you're choosing to represent a phrase with. So that's negation. So our next example is going to be writing the inverse and the contrapositive using symbolic notation. The inverse then would be if we take both the hypothesis and the conclusion and we negate them, so not p, then not q. And the contrapositive would be the inverse of the converse. So not q, then not p. So that's a discussion of inverse and contrapositive using only symbolic notation. The laws of logic. The next section is the laws of logic. When we're talking about the laws of logic, we're talking about law of detachment and law of syllogism. The law of detachment is just that, detaching the clauses from one another and deciding if one is true, then the other one can be true. So we are going to be assuming that P arrow Q, or if P then Q, is a true conditional statement, and P is true. So therefore, we can say that Q is true what that looks like is this. For this to work, the conditional statement must be true, and the first condition must be true. So we can't assume that the end is true. We cannot assume that Q is true unless the whole statement is true and P is true. So these are the two conditions that must be true for Q to be true. So in order for Q to be true, if P then Q must be true, and P must be true. That's the law of detachment. The law of syllogism. The law of syllogism is also known as the chain law. And you'll see why. The law of syllogism gives us a really long string of statements. Could be 3, could be 5, could be 20. But we're saying that if P then Q, and if Q happens, then R happens, and those things are true. So therefore, we can assume that the last bit of it is true, and if P then R is true. We're going to look at an example of that in just a minute. But basically, we cut out the middleman. So we go straight from P to R. What does that look like? For example, true statement number one. If Mike visits Alabama, then he will spend a day in Montgomery. We're assuming that that's true. And we're assuming that this statement is true also. If Mike spends a day in Montgomery, he will visit the Civil Rights Memorial. 
So we're going to take these phrases out and we're going to say that this is going to be P. This is going to be Q. And since the beginning of this one is the same as the end of the last one, we've just switched the if and then, this is going to be our R. Then he visits the Civil Rights Memorial. So we have P, Q, and R. We're going to put them together using the chain law. So the law of syllogism says that if P to Q is true, which we said that it was, if Mike visits Alabama, then he spends a day in Montgomery. And we assume that Q to R is true. If Mike spends a day in Montgomery, then he visits the Civil Rights Memorial. We're assuming that those two things are true. So P to Q is true. Q to R is true. So P to R must be true. So out of this arises the if-then statement. If Mike visits Alabama, then he will visit the Civil Rights Memorial. This goes from P to R. The law of syllogism, or the chain law, cuts out the middle condition that if he visits, if he spends a day in Montgomery, then he visits the Civil Rights Memorial. We're assuming because when he visits Alabama, he does that, visits Montgomery, that when he visits Alabama, he's going to visit the Civil Rights Memorial. So the chain law cuts out the middle.